Welcome to today's Train Engineers Newsletter Live program. Today's program is about air-to-air -air energy recovery. To cover this topic today, we have Train Application Engineers Greg Duchesne, Ronnie Moffitt, John Murphy, and Eric Sturm. Now, there are a variety of air-to-air -air energy recovery technologies applied in different ways. Energy recovery can be used in both mixed air systems and ventilation applications. And sometimes when an energy recovery device is used in a ventilation system, it's called an energy recovery ventilator, or ERV. Today, we're going to focus only on the technologies that are transferring energy between air streams. Greg will start us off with an overview of air-to-air -air energy recovery. Air-to-air -air energy recovery refers to the transfer of sensible heat or sensible heat and moisture between two air streams. The most common use is to precondition outdoor air as it enters the building for ventilation by exchanging energy with a separate airstream. In this case, an air-to-air -air exchanger is arranged to transfer energy between the outdoor air being brought into the building and the exhaust or relief air leaving the building. This is commonly referred to as exhaust air energy recovery. Another configuration recovers heat from either a separate airstream or a different location in the same airstream and uses it to reheat air that has been dehumidified. In the series configuration shown here, the air-to-air -air exchanger removes sensible heat from the entering outdoor air upstream of the dehumidifying coil. It then transfers that heat to reheat the air downstream of the coil. We often refer to this as supplier tempering. For this program, we're going to focus primarily on the left-hand application, exhaust air energy recovery. Air-to-air -air energy recovery devices are generally categorized as either sensible or total energy recovery. Sensible recovery devices transfer only sensible heat, so they raise or lower the dry bulb temperature of the airstream. On the other hand, total energy recovery devices transfer not only sensible heat, but also water vapor. So they raise or lower both the dry bulb temperature and the humidity ratio of the airstream. The first chart depicts a sensible recovery device being used for exhaust air energy recovery. Here I'm showing operation at cooling design conditions in the summer. When it's hot outside, Sensible heat is transferred from the outdoor air to the cooler exhaust airstream. This lowers the dry bulb temperature of the outdoor air entering the system, which reduces the load on the mechanical cooling equipment. At heating design conditions, the same device transfers sensible heat from the warmer exhaust air leaving the building to the cold air entering. This raises the dry bulb temperature of the entering air reducing the load on the heating equipment. Now let's compare that with a total energy recovery device operating at the same conditions. When it's hot and humid outside, total energy recovery transfers sensible heat, cooling the entering outdoor air, but it also transfers water vapor from the humid outdoor air to the drier exhaust airstream. This has the added effect of drying the entering air. The result is that total energy recovery lowers the enthalpy of the entering air a lot more than sensible recovery alone. This means that in a climate where humid outdoor air conditions, total energy recovery results in a greater reduction in the cooling load. When it's cold outside, it's also very dry. So in the winter, in addition to transferring sensible heat from the warmer exhaust air, total energy recovery also transfers water vapor from the more humid exhaust air, which then humidifies the entering outdoor air. Depending on the application, this can improve occupant comfort by keeping indoor humidity levels a little higher during the dry winter months. Or if a humidifier is installed, this reduces the humidification load too. So exhaust air energy recovery can reduce the cooling and heating energy required to condition the outdoor air being brought into the building. Of course, this device adds pressure drop to the airstreams which increases fan energy use. Therefore, you want to make sure the savings far outweigh any fan energy penalty. 
Since this concept offers the most benefit at extreme weather conditions or design conditions, it can also enable downsizing of the cooling and heating equipment. This would help offset some of the installed costs for the energy recovery device. On a related note, there's, there's recently been increased interest in reducing carbon dioxide equivalent footprints of buildings. This is often referred to as decarbonization, and we produce several ENLs on this subject. In the context of an HVAC system, decarbonization typically involves three core strategies. First is to improve the energy efficiency of the overall system. This reduces emissions from fuel combustion, either on-site or at the power plant. Second is to use refrigerants with a low global warming potential and minimize leakage of these refrigerants. And the third strategy is to reduce the use of fossil fuels by installing electrified HVAC equipment served by an electrical grid that relies more heavily on carbon-free energy sources such as solar, wind, and other renewables. The third strategy, often referred to as electrification, can present a challenge when a building requires heating. In many areas of the country, burning fossil fuels in furnaces or boilers has been the norm for heating a building. Air source heat pumps are a common solution for electrified heating, but their capacity and efficiency degrade as it gets colder outside, and they tend to be relatively expensive pieces of equipment. So exhaust air energy recovery can be especially valuable when designing a building for electrified heating because it reduces the load on these heat pumps and allows them to be downsized, which reduces the cost and space needed to install them. In the example I just showed, the sensible recovery device reduced the ventilation heating load by 50%, while the total recovery device reduced it by 70%. With all that said, sometimes exhaust air energy recovery is used simply because it's required to comply with the local energy code or building rating system. ASHRAE standard 90.1, which is used as the basis for many state and local codes, includes prescriptive requirements for exhaust air energy recovery. The requirements in your local code may differ because it depends on the version of the standard or code is being enforced in your jurisdiction. But here's an excerpt from the 2019 version of that standard. Note that there is a different set of requirements specifically for systems serving non-transient dwelling spaces such as apartments. These are addressed in a different section which I've included as a hidden slide in your handouts. For systems serving all other space types, whether or not exhaust air energy recovery is required depends on the climate zone, the design supply airflow, the percentage of outdoor air, and the number of hours the system is expected to operate throughout the year. To demonstrate, here's a table that applies to a system that will operate for less than 8,000 hours per year. Consider a building located in climate zone 3A. If the system is designed for 35% outdoor air, then exhaust air energy recovery will be required if the design supply airflow of that system is 5,500 CFM or larger. In general, note that for higher percentages of outdoor air, the exhaust air energy recovery is required on smaller and smaller systems. But in mild climate zones, it may not be required at all. When it is required, however, this energy recovery system must result in an enthalpy recovery ratio of at least 50%. And this is required at both heating and cooling design conditions. The ratio is defined as the change in enthalpy of the outdoor air as it passes through the supply side of the device from H1 to H2 divided by the difference between the enthalpies of the entering outdoor air, H1, and the entering exhaust air, H3. As I mentioned, the standard requires the minimum performance to be met at both heating and cooling design conditions, unless one of these is exempt by the exceptions. So here's a list of exceptions for this section. Exceptions four and five address the issue I just mentioned. In the warmest climate zone, the energy recovery system does not need to meet the 50% enthalpy recovery ratio at heating design conditions, only at cooling design. Likewise, 
In colder and drier climates, the 50% ratio need only be met at heating design conditions, not at cooling design. As for the other exceptions, we don't have time to talk through each one, so a good reference is standard 90.1 user's manual, which ASHRAE publishes to accompany the standard. But I will point out one more. Exception number one addresses buildings with laboratory exhaust. Often this exhaust can be hazardous, so cross leakage through the engine recovery device is usually not acceptable. Therefore, standard 90.1 includes a different set of requirements when recovering energy from laboratory exhaust. I've included these requirements in the hidden slide for your reference. But in short, for laboratory exhaust, you can comply by using any combination of very flow exhaust and makeup, plus sensible only exhaust air engine recovery. The practical impact is that a coil loop can typically be used, thereby allowing for a design that has zero cross leakage. Now, before Eric introduces the various technologies for air to air energy recovery, Let's talk briefly about testing and rating these devices. AHRI Standard 1060 defines the conditions and procedures for rating and certifying the performance of an air-to-air -air heat exchanger, while ASHRAE Standard 84 describes the method of testing. These standards introduce the term effectiveness, which is used to indicate how well this type of device transfers energy. Effectiveness is defined as the actual energy transferred divided by the theoretical maximum possible energy transfer between the two airstreams. Looking at the equation for sensible effectiveness, the numerator is the mass flow of the outdoor air passing through the supply side of the device times the change in dry bulb temperature from entering to leaving, that is, from location one to location two. The denominator, again, is the maximum possible energy transfer, which is dictated by the dry bulb temperature of the air entering at location one, minus the temperature of the entering exhaust air at location three. Note that if the outdoor and exhaust flow rates are not equal, the maximum energy transfer is limited by the smaller of these two flow rates. The equation for calculating latent effectiveness is similar, but it uses humidity ratios in place of dry bulb temperatures. And there's a third equation, which I didn't show for total effectiveness, that combines both sensible and latent transfer. Now in the past, AHRI 1060 defined two sets of air conditions for rating these devices, one for cooling and one for heating. This is similar to how we certify the performance of a packaged rooftop unit or water chiller at a specific operating point. But in the latest version, this has changed to defining a range of conditions for certified performance. So now it's more like how we certify the performance of a chilled water or hot water coil. The engine recovery device is certified for any set of psychometric conditions within the blue boundary. Note that the left side of this boundary, AHRI, only certifies down to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. This is due to the difficulty of testing at conditions where frost might form. However, these technologies are commonly used at colder conditions. In addition to effectiveness and air pressure drop, the AHRI rating standard also requires measurement of cross leakage. This refers to air that leaks through the device itself from one airstream to the other. For some applications, leakage of exhaust air into the entering outdoor airstream could be dangerous, so it needs to be avoided altogether. But for the vast majority of applications, cross leakage is not problematic, as long as it's not excessive. Ronnie will discuss this further later in the program. Thanks, Greg. Next, Eric and Ronnie are going to discuss common energy recovery technologies and their performance. The first technology we'll look at is coil loops. In all these examples, we're going to review outdoor air preconditioning configurations. Coil loops, sometimes called coil runaround loops, have two or more fin tube coils that are piped together in a closed loop. A fluid is circulated by a pump between the coils to transfer 
sensible heat from one airstream to another. The fluid is often water mixed with a freeze inhibitor like glycol. Also, an expansion tank is needed because the fluid volume will change with temperature. In the cooling season, hot outdoor air enters the building for ventilation. The air passes through a coil with fluid circulating through it. As a result, the outdoor air is cooled. This warm fluid is circulated to the other coil in the exhaust air stream, where the heat is absorbed by the exhaust air as it leaves the building. In the heating season, warm exhaust air heats the fluid in the coil. This fluid is circulated to the coil in the ventilation air stream and the outdoor air is heated. Let's look at individual coil performance for this system. First, here's a chart showing sensible effectiveness along the vertical axis and coil face velocity across the horizontal axis. Three different coils are plotted. The solid line at the top represents an eight row, 12 fins per inch coil. The middle dashed line shows a six row, 10 fins per inch coil. And finally, the lower dashed line shows a four row, 10 fins per inch coil. Now because they're so flexible, effectiveness varies, but as applied, they're generally between 50 and 55%. The coil with more heat transfer surface area performs the best showing the highest effectiveness. As heat transfer surface area decreases, sensible effectiveness decreases. And as coil face velocity increases, effectiveness also decreases. But that comes at a cost. The second chart on the right side shows air pressure drop along the vertical axis and face velocity across the horizontal axis. The eight row 12 fins per inch coil has the highest air pressure drop at all velocities. As the heat transfer surface area decreases, the air pressure drop also decreases. The maximum face velocity in these charts is 700 feet per minute. But in a ductwork system, the velocity could be two, three, or maybe even four times that. At much higher air velocities, heat transfer and air pressure drop will be impacted. Additionally, we have to consider the water pressure drop of each coil. In this example, the eight row coil has a water pressure drop of 19 feet of water, while the four row coil has a pressure drop of only 10 feet. Each technology will have a cost associated with the recovery of energy. For coil loops, there's an air pressure drop and a water pressure drop. Finally, as we've seen, these pressure drops are a function of the component and face velocity. The deeper coils may recover more energy, but they'll also increase fan energy and fluid pump power. For coil loops, there may be some additional requirements, including coil drain pans, filtration to keep the coil surfaces clean, and access to the coil for cleaning. Coil loops are very flexible for several reasons. First, they can transfer heat between airstreams that are physically separated by some distance. This means that the outdoor air intake and exhaust air outlet don't necessarily need to be next to each other. Next, a coil loop can recover heat from multiple exhaust air streams, called a networked coil loop. Here's an example where heat is recovered from a laboratory exhaust system. Two coils are placed in two separate exhaust systems to reclaim heat. This heat is then transferred to six different air handlers to precondition the incoming ventilation air. There will be more piping, a larger pump with more pump power, and more glycol when there's a large distance between the coils, or if multiple coils are used in a networked coil loop system. We're going to build a comparison table today. This table is designed to illustrate typical performance as these technologies are applied. Coil loops are very versatile, allowing outdoor air preconditioning and supply air tempering configurations. And they can be applied in networked arrangements where many coils are combined in a single heat recovery system. Coil loops only transfer sensible heat, no latent heat with an effectiveness between 50 and 55%. Each coil has a typical air pressure drop between 0.5 
and 0.9 inches of water. The separation of air paths also reduces the likelihood of cross-contamination, where pollutants or odors from one airstream migrate into the other airstream, so no cross-leakage. The next technology we'll look at is heat pipes. A heat pipe is like a coil loop, but not quite as flexible. The typical configuration requires the air flows to be side by side, as shown here. Each assembly contains multiple heat pipes. Each is an independent sealed tube filled with a heat transfer fluid, often refrigerant. A partition divides the heat pipe into separate evaporator and condenser sections. To control heat recovery, units may include bypass dampers to route air around the heat pipe or valves to restrict the flow of refrigerant. Now here's an overhead view of a heat pipe to illustrate an outdoor air preconditioning arrangement. First, let's look at operating during the cooling season. Here, the outdoor air is warmer than the exhaust air, so the evaporator is in the outdoor airstream and the condenser is in the exhaust airstream. Refrigerant is evaporated by the warmer outdoor air and the refrigerant vapor pressure increases. The vapor migrates to condense and release heat to the exhaust airstream where the vapor pressure is lower. Liquid refrigerant wicks back to the evaporator section of the heat pipe and the cycle is repeated. During the heating season, the process remains the same, but refrigerant migration direction is reversed. Refrigerant vapor produced by absorbing heat from the exhaust air migrates through the evaporator to the condenser and releases heat to the outdoor airstream, warming it up. Heat pipe and coil loop performance is similar, except in regions with higher air velocity. Here, you can see the sensible effectiveness begins to drop. In general, heat pipe effectiveness ranges from 30 to 52%. Air pressure drop through the heat pipe is similar to the coil loop as well. Again, the air pressure drop increases as the face velocity increases. Unlike the coil loop, there are no pumps. The only energy cost for this technology is the additional fan power to push air through the heat pipe. So let's add heat pipes to the table. Heat pipes can be used to precondition outdoor air in a side-by-side -side configuration. Some manufacturers also provide configurations that are wrapped around a cooling coil, providing supplier tempering. Heat pipes transfer sensible energy, but no latent energy. As we saw, sensible effectiveness is very similar to coil loops, and air pressure drop is fairly similar too. Heat pipes generally have minimal cross leakage. The next technology is the fixed plate heat exchanger. It uses a series of plates with internal separators to create independent, separate airflow channels. There are different materials used, but aluminum is the most common. The plates and separators are stacked with alternate edges being sealed to prevent cross leakage. These exchangers can be made to withstand large pressure differentials, with some up to 10 inches of water between the sides. Fixed plate heat exchangers can be designed to handle higher temperatures and sometimes have an optional corrosion protection coating. Capacity control is handled with face and bypass dampers. John's going to talk about that later. Fixed plate heat exchangers can be applied in a variety of ways. Each configuration must be cross flow, however. This allows some flexibility in fan placement and inlet and outlet locations. This heating season configuration shows outdoor air entering the air handler on the upper right, absorbing heat as it passes through the heat exchanger, a heating coil, and exiting at the lower left. Meanwhile, exhaust air from the building moves from right to left, starting in the lower right side. The exhaust air passes through the heat exchanger, releasing heat to it, and finally exiting the building. And there are other ways to lay out components and accomplish the same task. We've been using face velocity to discuss airflow through these devices. In these examples, the fixed plate heat exchanger has been set at an angle, which means the heat exchanger face velocity will be lower 
than the air handler face velocity. For example, a 500 feet per minute air handler will have an exchanger face velocity between 350 and 400 feet per minute on average. Here's the chart depicting sensible effectiveness for a 10,000 CFM fixed plate with the effectiveness generally between 60 and 70 percent. Also, notice that the general slope of the effectiveness lines doesn't decrease as rapidly as the other technologies. Sizing and plate spacing have the largest impact on effectiveness. The face velocity has lesser impact. In this example, an air handler face velocity of 600 feet per minute will only have a lower effectiveness by several percentage points compared to a 400 feet per minute unit. But face velocity does have a large impact on the pressure drop. Reducing the air handler face velocity from 600 to 400 feet per minute will cut the air pressure drop in half. Fixed plate heat exchangers can be provided in outdoor air preconditioning and series configurations. They only transfer sensible energy. And as we previously saw, sensible effectiveness ranges between 60 and 70 percent, while air pressure drop typically ranges from 0.4 to 0.8 inches of water. Air streams are separated, resulting in minimal cross leakage. A variation of fixed plate heat exchanger is the membrane exchanger. Instead of aluminum plates, a vapor permeable membrane can be used to exchange sensible heat and water vapor. Like aluminum plates, the air flows are cross flow and sensible heat is exchanged. However, in addition to heat transfer, water vapor is transferred between air streams through the membrane. The membrane exchanger is constructed of solid sheets of material designed to absorb water vapor. The process that exchanges the water vapor from one airstream to the other is permeation. Water vapor permeates to the airstream of lower water vapor pressure. Let's look at summer cooling example. Here, the entering outdoor air is 92 degrees Fahrenheit and 122 grains of water vapor per pound of air. The water vapor pressure at these conditions is 0.4 PSI. Return air is at 75 degrees and 60 grains, which is a vapor pressure of 0.2 PSI. This pressure differential is the force that transmits the water vapor molecules through the solid membrane material. This example has a 44% latent effectiveness at these conditions, assuming equal airflows. Here is the same membrane exchanger shown during heating. The water vapor pressure is higher on the exhaust air stream. Thus water vapor is recovered from the exhaust air to the outdoor air. The more saturated the membrane is with water vapor, the higher the transfer rate at which water vapor can be transported through the membrane. The relative humidity of the exhaust and outdoor air stream are higher in the winter, which results in a more saturated membrane and higher transfer rate. This characteristic will be different depending on the membrane. For this example membrane, the latent effectiveness increases to 58%. During the winter heating mode, the latent effectiveness will be highest. When it's hot and dry outside, the latent effectiveness will be lowest. However, there is not much humidity to transfer at this condition, so total recovery may be more. The latent effectiveness will be higher during a hot, humid day when the recovery is needed the most versus on a hot, dry day. The degree of this variance will depend on the membrane used. For the membrane used in my examples, the latent effectiveness is 58% in the winter, 44% during a normal, humid summer day, but during a dry, hot day, it will drop to 28%. This characteristic does highlight the need to look at different operating points when specifying membrane exchangers. The AHRI 1060 certification program certifies performance at an envelope of psychometric conditions, not just at a point, for this very reason. Unlike aluminum plate heat exchangers, membrane heat exchangers are made from a pliable membrane material. 
Most commercial exchangers have aluminum mesh or flutes to provide structural support to help withstand the static pressure differentials between the supply and the exhaust airstreams, which are found in commercial applications. Membranes are more limited in size compared to the sensible metal plate exchangers. The largest exchangers are approximately two feet by two feet. Using a two by one aspect ratio, that's only 2,400 CFM. Two methods are used to support the larger airflows needed for many commercial buildings, wider spacing or a bank of exchangers. First, the membrane exchanger can be constructed with wider spacing between the membrane layers. Then four of these wide spacing membrane exchangers can be combined as a single assembly to accommodate a higher airflow. This expands usage for exchangers that can be manufactured at wider membrane spacings. For capacity control, the membrane exchanger will need a face and bypass damper. A face damper is needed to block air from flowing through one side of the exchanger and to direct air to a 100% bypass path where a bypass damper is also required. An alternative to using four wide spacing exchangers together is to arrange high efficiency spaced membrane exchangers in a bank with multiple block offs to route air through each membrane exchanger. However, this adds high air pressure loss due to the transitions, which can be more than an inch of added static pressure. It also requires a much bigger footprint and makes face and bypass dampers, which are required for capacity control, not feasible. So the bank layout will require an external bypass or other means to control recovery capacity. These shortfalls limit where this method can be used. Membrane exchangers have a nominal face velocity in the 200 to 350 feet per minute range. This corresponds to an air handler face velocity in the 300 to 400 feet per minute range. Most likely the membrane exchanger will drive the size of the air handler. If the air handler is sized in this range, sensible effectiveness shown in orange typically ranges from 65 to 70%. Latent effectiveness shown in purple will vary on conditions. 35 to 45% is typical at cooling design conditions, while 45 to 55% is typical during winter heating. A single membrane core has a pressure drop in the range of 0.7 to 1.3 inches of water. As I discussed, if assembled in a bank of multiple exchangers with transitions, this greatly increases the total pressure drop of the bank. This bank has an air pressure drop typically between 1.5 and 3 inches per airstream. As I mentioned, using a bank has limited applications for this reason. Filling in the table for membrane exchangers, you can see they have a sensible effectiveness similar to metal plate exchangers. But for a little higher pressure drop, they do latent recovery also. Just remember this is as applied. Membrane exchangers are typically applied at 30 to 40% lower face velocity than a metal plate exchanger. The next type of heat exchanger is a sensible assisted membrane, or SAM. SAM is a cross-flow heat exchanger that combines membrane exchangers and sensible aluminum plate exchangers together in one assembly. This expands the scale and the physical size where membrane exchangers can be used, thus increasing the airflow range where total energy recovery cross-flow exchangers can be used. This allows them to be applied in larger commercial buildings. The smaller size SAM allows the use of the high efficient membrane spacing exchangers instead of using block offs and transitions to direct flow, two aluminum fixed plate exchangers are used. Instead of four wide spacing membrane exchangers shown previously, two high efficient membrane exchangers are combined with two sensible metal plate exchangers to make one assembly. The largest size SAM uses the largest size aluminum exchanger, which is 3.3 feet. 
Two of these large metal plate exchangers are paired up with two large membrane exchangers. This largest SAM is 6.6 .6 feet by 6.6 .6 feet. This allows the SAM exchanger to have an airflow range more than double what is achievable with membrane exchangers alone. The metal exchangers increase the overall sensible effectiveness, 5% higher than with either a membrane or sensible plate alone for the same phase velocity. SAM has the highest sensible effectiveness with 75% being typical while achieving 30 to 60% latent effectiveness depending on the conditions. The sensible plates actually enhance this latent performance. As I previously discussed, at higher relative humidity, the membranes will have a higher latent recovery. The far membrane exchangers will have air pre-cooled by the upstream aluminum plate exchanger. This increases the relative humidity, which increases the membrane's latent performance. No transitions or block offs are needed. Unlike a bank of membrane exchangers, SAM uses metal plate exchangers to direct airflow to the second membrane. This makes SAM more usable in a typical air handler configuration and allows the use of face and bypass dampers. For example of how large air flows can go, here's a 34,000 CFM air handler. The single SAM exchanger also includes modulating face and bypass dampers for capacity control. The exchanger has a fully open internal face for good airflow to upstream and downstream components, such as high efficiency filters, coils, or a fan array. For 100% outdoor air units, the cross flow arrangement allows for the outdoor intake to be far away from the exhaust discharge. SAM used for cooling recovery with a target of 50% total effectiveness will be used at a similar air handler face velocity as a membrane exchanger in the 300 to 400 feet per minute range for optimum performance versus footprint required. SAM will have a sensible effectiveness in the range of 72 to 77% with a latent effectiveness in the summer of 38 to 45% for a total effectiveness of 50 to 54% during summer peak cooling. Total effectiveness during winter heating will be in the range of 68 to 72%. SAM is also available with a wide spacing exchanger. This is for use at higher air velocity, sized for the application at 450 to 550 feet per minute air handler velocity. This high air velocity version of the sensible assisted membrane is used for winter heating, since latent recovery in the summer will be very low. However, using the maximum spacing achievable on the membrane exchangers will avoid the need to oversize the air handler. The advantage of this SAM over a sensible fixed plate exchanger is that it will have approximately 5% higher sensible effectiveness for the same size. And more beneficial than this is that it helps avoid condensate and ice formation, which John and I will discuss later. As with metal plate exchangers, sensible effectiveness does not change much with face velocity. But face velocity does have a large impact on the pressure drop. Summarizing in the table, SAM exchangers will have the highest as applied sensible effectiveness with latent effectiveness similar to the membranes, or they can have similar sensible effectiveness to a metal fixed plate exchanger, but still have some latent effectiveness. The last technology we're going to discuss is rotary heat exchangers, commonly called heat recovery wheels. Some wheels are designed for sensible heat transfer only. However, most models are designed to transfer sensible and latent heat. Wheels in this latter category are sometimes called total energy wheels or enthalpy wheels. The wheel rotates between 20 and 60 revolutions per minute between the exhaust and outdoor air streams. Total energy wheels are made with or covered with a desiccant and adsorbent that attracts water vapor. Examples include silica gel, polymers, molecular sieves, 
and others. As the wheel rotates between air streams, sensible heat is transferred to the material from the hot air stream and released in the cold air stream. Similarly, latent heat is transferred as the desiccant adsorbs water vapor from the air stream with higher humidity and desorbs in the air stream with lower humidity. This means colder air is heated and drier air is humidified. Capacity control is done with bypass dampers or modulating wheel speed. Wheels experience cross leakage and it can happen in multiple ways. Seal leakage, matrix leakage, and carryover. Cross leakage can be wasteful and result in the system fans having to move more air than was originally required. The system design can reduce cross leakage and minimize its impact. The first and largest source of cross leakage is the wheel face where pressure differentials between the two air paths drive air movement, seal leakage. Here, air will leak from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure. In this case, it's from the outdoor air section into the exhaust air section through the seal. A rubber non-contact block or nylon brushes can be used to reduce seal leakage. The pressure differential between the exhaust and outdoor air paths should be minimized. This can be done with careful fan placement. Here are a variety of different configurations. The fourth and final arrangement shows a blow-through exhaust fan and draw-through supply fan. In this arrangement, the supply side will be the lower pressure side, resulting in leakage from the exhaust to the supply. Usually, this is undesirable, so this arrangement is not recommended. The wheel matrix, or the material performing heat transfer, can be manufactured in different ways. Some designs allow air to migrate through the wheel from areas of higher pressure to areas of lower pressure, causing matrix leakage. The last common source of leakage is carryover, where air is entrained in the wheel as it rotates into the other airstream. As the wheel rotates, some of the exhaust air is carried over into the supply airstream. To reduce this, a purge section can be added to the wheel. This wedge-shaped section diverts some outer air through the wheel to flush it. Like fixed plate and fixed membrane heat exchangers, which are turned on their sides, the face velocity of the wheel is different than the air handler face velocity. Wheels typically have face velocities greater than 700 feet per minute, which corresponds to an air handler face velocity of about 500 feet per minute. As applied, total energy wheels have a sensible effectiveness shown in the solid line that ranges from 60 to 80 percent, and a latent effectiveness in the dashed line ranging from 55 to 75 percent. Air pressure drop values range from about 0.4 to 1.2 inches of water for each side of the energy wheel. Here we've added sensible and total energy wheels independently. Sensible wheels can have slightly higher sensible effectiveness values compared to total energy wheels. Both wheel types experience cross leakage as we previously discussed. This cross leakage can be minimized but not eliminated. Whichever technology you choose for a given application, it's important to ensure that it is controlled properly to maximize energy savings. Next, John will discuss why and when control is necessary. As Greg mentioned earlier, exhaust air energy recovery reduces the ventilation load when it's hot outside and also when it's cold outside. But most climates have a lot of hours when the weather is mild. At those conditions, unless you control the device properly, it can transfer unwanted heat and actually increase system energy use. To demonstrate, this schematic depicts an example mixed air VAV system delivering 30,000 CFM of air at 55 degrees. Here, a wheel is used to exchange energy between the 10,000 CFM of outdoor air and 7,000 CFM of exhaust. Now I'm showing a wheel here, but the principles apply to all the devices, 
we just discussed. Now at this point in time, it's pretty mild outside and the drive-up temperature is 55 degrees. If we let the energy recovery device continue operating at these conditions, it will transfer heat from the warmer exhaust air, which is at 70 degrees, to this cooler outdoor air, warming it up to about 65 degrees. And this preheated outdoor air then mixes with recirculated return air and the resulting mixed air temperature is 68 degrees. Now since this is warmer than the desired discharge set point of 55, the cooling coil must activate to cool the air down 13 degrees to set point. Now instead, what if we turn the energy recovery device off? In this case, without the wheel rotating and with air bypassing, no energy is transferred. The 55 degree outdoor air mixes with recirculated air and the mixed air temperature is now 65 degrees. So with the wheel off, the cooling coil needs to cool the air only 10 degrees. Therefore, at this condition, operating the energy recovery device would actually cause the system to use more cooling energy. 13 degrees of cooling with the device on versus 10 degrees of cooling with it off. Now, if this system includes a capability for air site economizing, then it would likely be in economizing mode at this time. In this case, the outdoor damper is fully open while the recircling damper is closed. All 30,000 CFM of supply air is coming from outdoors and no mechanical cooling is required. To accommodate economizer operation, add bypass dampers to allow full economizer airflow without significantly increasing the air side pressure drop in fan energy use. In fact, this is part of the ASHRAE 90.1 requirements that Greg introduced earlier. If economizer is required by the standard, then the energy recovery system must include some provision to permit economizer operation. Now the approach for turning off an energy recovery device differs among the various technologies. It's pretty straightforward with a wheel, just turn off the motor to stop the wheel from rotating. Similar for a coil loop, you just turn off the circulating pump. Or in the case of a network coil loop, you can close the valve for that specific supply side coil. But for a fixed plate or membrane heat exchanger, you need to a way to prevent one of the two air streams from passing through the device. This is commonly done with face and bypass dampers. Here's a photo of a plate exchanger. The air flows are cross flow with outdoor air entering into the top backside passing down through the heat exchanger. Then the exhaust air enters the, into the bottom backside and travels at an upward angle. Now plate exchangers are unique in that they can be constructed with a bypass path through the middle of the heat exchanger. Here's the opening for this bypass path and here you can see the block off in the outdoor air path. So with the bypass dampers open and face dampers shut, as we're showing here, all the exhaust air passes through this open section in the center of the heat exchanger, so no heat is transferred. Membrane exchangers aren't currently constructed with an integral bypass path, so you need face and bypass dampers with an external bypass path around the exchanger. However, as Ronnie showed earlier, the SAM exchanger can be constructed with a bypass path through the middle. Now heat pipes also use an external bypass path with face and bypass dampers, but some styles may offer one or more solenoid valves that can prevent refrigerant from moving inside the tubes and stop heat transfer. Let's again go back to the same example system, but now look at a cooler outdoor condition, say 40 degrees. The system is still bringing in 10,000 CFM of outdoor air, but during this cooler weather, the VAV system is delivering only 18,000 CFM of supply air. The discharge air temperature set point has been reset up from 55 to 60 degrees. Again, let's consider what would happen if we let the energy recovery device continue operating at full heat recovery capacity. 
it transfers heat from the warmer exhaust air to the cold outdoor air, warming it to about 60 degrees. This preheated outdoor air mixes with recirculated air for a mixed air temperature of 64 degrees. Now since this is warmer than the desired discharge set point of 60, the cooling coil must now activate to cool the air back down 4 degrees. So the energy recovery device just overheated the air, requiring recooling. So what if we turn the device off instead? With no heat recovery, the mixed air temperature is 53 degrees. Now the heating coil must activate to warm the air up 7 degrees to the desired 60 degree set point. So if we turn off the energy recovery device, we're not taking advantage of its ability to recover heat. Instead, we're using new energy to heat the air. Of course, the right answer is that we need to have some way to limit the capacity of the energy recovery device so it doesn't overheat the air. In this example with the wheel, the exhaust side bypass dampers are modulated to partially open. With less warm air passing through the exhaust side of the wheel, the outdoor air passing through the other side does not heat up as much, warming it to only 52 degrees. The resulting mixed air temperature is now 60, so neither the cooling coil nor the heating coil need to operate. Again, the approach for modulating the capacity of the various devices differs. Many coil loops use a three-way valve to reduce the flow rate through the supply side coil when less heat transfer is desired. Alternatively, you could equip the circulating pump with a variable speed control to reduce the fluid flow rate and heat transfer. Heat pipes use face and bypass dampers or multiple integral solenoid valves to reduce capacity. Fixed plate heat exchangers use the same face and bypass damper configuration that I showed earlier, but now they modulate those dampers to vary the amount of heat transferred. Membrane exchangers would also use face and bypass dampers for this. Then for a wheel, some manufacturers suggest varying the rotational speed of the wheel to control its capacity. However, Train recommends modulating the exhaust side bypass damper like I just described. Now Ronnie wrote a white paper to explain our recommendation. We've included that in the bibliography if you want more detail. Now finally, during very cold weather, as more and more heat is removed from the exhaust air stream and transferred to the outdoor air, the condition of the exhaust air can be cooled to the point where it reaches a saturated condition. Shown here is a sensible energy recovery device where the exhaust air is at 70 degrees dry bulb and a 41 degree dew point. Now this equates to 35% relative humidity. That's pretty humid for this winter design day when it's minus 15 degrees outside. So this is likely a building with humidifiers installed like a lab, museum, or a hospital. As this 41 degree dew point exhaust air cools down below 41 dry bulb, which is the red dash line here, it reaches saturation. So water vapor begins to condense on the exhaust side coil of the device. If the surface temperature is colder than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, this condensate will freeze. Now the system won't operate this condition for very long since the ice will eventually block off airflow and possibly, possibly damage the device. In this case, some method is needed to prevent this condensate from freezing, which I'll describe in a bit. But when the outdoor air is very cold, it's also really, really dry. So the air inside most buildings is much drier than in this example, unless there's a humidifier installed. So here's the same example system, but the exhaust air is at 15% RH. When the dew point temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it's actually referred to as the frost point temperature instead. In this example, this lower humidity equates to a 21 degree frost point. 
With this drier exhaust air, it can now cool down to 21 degrees dry bulb before frost begins to form on the exhaust side of the device. So the drier the indoor air, the less likely ice formation or frosting is to occur. Now for comparison, this green dashed line shows the condition of the exhaust air as it passes through a total energy recovery device. In this case, the transfer of water vapor from the wetter exhaust to the drier outdoor air keeps the condition of this exhaust air further away from the saturation curve. Since sensible recovery devices do not transfer water vapor, the leaving exhaust air condition reaches saturation and freezes or frosts at warmer outdoor temperatures than it would for a total energy recovery device. However, with any type of technology, depending on the conditions, some method may be needed to prevent frosting. The method used for ice or frost prevention varies, but in either case, it involves reducing the heat recovery capacity of the device or preheating the air before it enters the device. Coil loops typically use the same three-way valve but this time to keep the fluid temperature warm enough so that the surface temperature of the exhaust side coil doesn't drop below the current frost point temperature or below 32 degrees Fahrenheit if the exhaust air is humid. Heat pipes can modulate the face and bypass dampers to reduce heat transfer and prevent frosting. And wheels can modulate the supply side bypass damper to accomplish the same. The risk of icing or frosting in cross-flow exchangers, like the fixed plate or membrane exchangers, is unique because the temperature gradient is not uniform. The exhaust will be much colder in the leaving corner closest to the outdoor intake side. To demonstrate, here is an example sensible only fixed plate heat exchanger where the entering exhaust air is 70 degrees and 30% relative humidity. This equates to a dew point of 37. Since the dew point is above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, there is a high risk of liquid condensate forming and then turning into ice. This needs to be avoided to prevent damage to the exchanger and blockage of airflow. The entering outdoor air is 15 degrees, so the metal plates of the exchanger, which are closest to the entering outdoor air side, will be the coldest, cooling to the exhaust air below its dew point, creating condensate that will freeze. These exchangers are most susceptible to ice forming in this cold corner where the exhaust air has nearly finished passing through the heat exchanger. So these metal plate exchangers will require some means to reduce capacity in order to prevent ice formation. Some manufacturers add a frost avoidance damper to divert outdoor air away from this cold corner when ice may occur. A membrane exchanger, however, is different. As the exhaust air is cooled, as it passes through the membrane, water vapor is also being removed and transferred to the outdoor airstream. So the dew point of the exhaust air is reduced and the risk of liquid condensate turning to ice is removed. Recall that the SAM exchanger uses a combination of membrane and metal plate exchangers. On the left-hand edge, where that coldest outdoor air enters, the exhaust air passes through the membrane first. So the exhaust air is dehumidified below 32 degree frost point before it enters the metal plate in the cold corner. The risk of liquid condensate turning to ice is removed. At the far right-hand corner, the icing conditions are also reduced. The exhaust air that reaches this corner passes through a plate exchanger first, where it is pre-cooled. This increases the relative humidity of the air, which increases the latent effectiveness of the membrane. Even though SAM exchanger has a higher sensible effectiveness compared to a metal plate exchanger alone, the latent transfer through the membranes and the orientation of where that transfer occurs removes the risk of icing. A high velocity, wide spacing SAM exchanger with a winter latent effectiveness of 34% percent 
may not seem like a lot of water vapor transfer. However, this will have a significant impact in preventing ice. A SAM exchanger with 75% sensible effectiveness will operate at conditions just shown, while a sensible only plate exchanger would need to reduce recovery to prevent ice. So far, the methods of ice or frost prevention we described each involve reducing the heat recovery capacity of the device. So that means you also get less energy savings during the coldest times of the year. As an alternative, any of the technologies could use a preheat coil to warm either the outdoor air or exhaust air before it enters the device. Now, depending on conditions, preheating the incoming outdoor air typically requires the smallest preheat coil. But preheating the exhaust air can result in less overall heat required and doesn't risk coil freezing if hot water is used. Now this preheat strategy is most common in very cold climates or for applications where frosting is expected to occur for many hours throughout the year. In these cases, spending a little bit of energy to preheat the air enough to avoid ice or frost may be warranted because it allows the energy recovery device to continue operating at full heat recovery capacity during the coldest weather. What technology should be used where? Some applications will dictate the type of exchanger that should be used. This could be driven by how much exhaust air transfer is acceptable and what mitigation is required to achieve this. Then there is the quality of the exhaust air and what pollutants are in the air you're trying to recover energy from. The next is the building site. What's there to work with in terms of existing ductwork and what footprint is available to install the device? And finally, sometimes a customer has a preference for their own reasons. The first of these deciding factors is how critical it is to limit the transfer of exhaust air to the outdoor airstream. Is it required to fully isolate the exhaust air from the incoming supply? Or is there just a desire to remove the exhaust air transfer potential? Or is this an everyday application and the goal is to minimize exhaust air transfer to an acceptable level? For some applications, there may be a requirement to isolate the exhaust air from the supplier. This means the two air streams cannot be adjacent to each other since the risk of transferring exhaust air to the adjacent airstream needs to be removed. ASHRAE 170 is the standard for ventilation in healthcare facilities. This standard requires certain zones of a hospital, specifically infectious isolation rooms and protective equipment rooms, to isolate the exhaust from the supply. But the air change rate in these rooms is high, making exhaust air energy recovery attractive. The majority of the zones in a hospital do not fall in this category. ASHRAE standard 62.1 also requires isolation when recovering energy from a class four exhaust airstream. Laboratories with this class of exhaust air often have a very large exhaust air requirement, making exhaust air energy recovery very beneficial. When there is a requirement to isolate the exhaust, this will dictate the use of a coil loop if exhaust air energy recovery is desired. The primary advantage of a coil loop is that the exhaust outlets and the outdoor air intakes do not need to be near each other in the building. For most laboratories, there will be outdoor air intakes spread across the building in various sized outdoor air handlers, then one central exhaust air handler. The outdoor air intakes and the exhaust air discharge are not close. The heat exchanger transferring energy from the exhaust air to the outdoor air does not come in contact with the exhaust air. This is just for where isolation is required by the industry ventilation standard or wherever there is toxic exhaust that needs to be isolated as determined by the local authority having jurisdiction. The next level is to remove the potential for exhaust air to transfer. This could be from a local code requirement or might be a building owner's requirement. In this case, there is a concern about the transfer of exhaust air 
but isolation is not required. One reason for this could be to minimize the transfer of particulates and viruses from the exhaust to supply. There are two sources of exhaust air transfer. First, if the static pressure in the outdoor airstream is less than the pressure in the exhaust airstream, this will create the potential for exhaust air to transfer into the supply air. If gaps or holes exist in the air handler casing, there will be transfer from the higher pressure exhaust airstream to the lower pressure outdoor airstream. The second source is carryover. If the exchanger media is cycled between the exhaust and outdoor airstream, then there is a potential for exhaust air to carry over and transfer air into the outdoor airstream. An energy recovery wheel rotates the media between the two airstreams, so some carryover occurs. To remove the first source, the static pressure in the outdoor airstream can be maintained higher than in the exhaust airstream. I'll discuss how to do this in a bit. To remove the potential for carryover transfer, you can choose an exchanger that does not cycle exhaust air and outdoor air through the same channels. While wheels always have some potential for carryover, the cross-flow heat exchangers, either with metal plates or membranes, do not. Unlike wheels, even though the airstreams are adjacent, the exhaust air surfaces do not come in contact with outdoor air. The metal plates or membranes are a solid barrier between the two airstreams. If particulates pass through the exhaust filter, they continue to pass through the exchanger. This would include airborne viruses. There is no cycling of outdoor air in the exhaust channels, so the potential for transfer by carryover is removed. To remove pressure-driven transfer, Fan placement can be used to achieve the desired static pressure differential. For a cross-flow exchanger, the draw-through, draw-through arrangement shown here will typically have a higher static pressure in the outdoor air path than in the exhaust air path, thus removing pressure-driven transfer. Using a blow-through fan in the outdoor air path, as shown in the lower schematic, is usually not necessary. If exhaust transfer is a concern, both design and expected operating conditions should be checked. If it is critical, then sensors can be added to measure the differential between these two air paths. If the pressure differential goes negative, an alarm can be activated or some control sequence can react. This method will remove the potential for pressure-driven transfer and the exhaust air transfer ratio will be zero. However, the only way to guarantee no cross leakage is to isolate the exhaust. The majority of commercial building spaces fall in this last category, where exhaust air transfer is to be minimized to an acceptable level. Per the current ASHRAE standards for ventilation, either 5 or 10% exhaust air transfer is acceptable, depending on the class of the exhaust air stream. When a wheel is used, exhaust air will carry over in the channels of the wheel media, even against a pressure differential. As Eric mentioned, a wheel can be equipped with a purge sector installed to flush the channels with additional outdoor air. This will reduce carryover. However, purge sectors waste a lot of fan energy by moving excess air. If the static pressure in the outdoor air path is higher than the exhaust air path, then with just carryover transfer, a purge sector typically is not needed to get exhaust air transfer to an acceptable level. While the leakage potential cannot be removed when using a wheel, exhaust air transfer is most likely to be less than 5% even without a purge. This is acceptable for most comfort cooling and heating applications. Just check the EATR value during exchanger selection to confirm. Sometimes these different thresholds apply in the same building. For example, here is an elementary school building where depending on the space, the owner's requesting different levels of exhaust air transfer mitigation. The classrooms, which make up the majority of the floor space, 
are served by an air handler that includes a total energy recovery wheel. This system has been designed to reduce exhaust air transfer potential by configuring the air handler to achieve the desired pressure differential between the two airstreams. However, for the administrative areas, reception and the nurse station, the owner has requested to remove the potential for exhaust air transfer. So this area is served by an air handler that includes a SAM exchanger with exhaust drawn from the nurse station. So in some cases, the type of exchanger may be driven by how much exhaust air transfer is acceptable. In other cases, the choice might be driven by the quality of the exhaust air and what pollutants are in the air you are trying to recover energy from. For instance, if there are oils or aerosols in the exhaust air stream, these can coat surfaces and prevent latent transfer. If this is the case, these processes should use sensible exchangers since latent transfer will be hampered. Or if there's a large source of particulates or soot that could accumulate on exchanger surfaces, wide spaced metal plate exchangers are the best fit since they can be clean the easiest and have the widest spacing. If the exhaust air is very humid, sensible plate exchangers or coil loops are the best fit as these exchangers are designed to handle and remove large amounts of condensate, which will be created in these applications. The next set of factors are existing ductwork and footprint limitations. If you have an existing building with ducts and air inlet locations that cannot be moved, this often leads to using a coil loop. In this example building, there is a existing central ventilation duct and exhaust outlets throughout the building. In this case, a coil loop may be the only option. 50 to 55% sensible recovery with a coil loop may not sound like much, but it will make a huge impact on the peak heat demand in the winter and what is required from a heat pump system. Another factor that impacts the decision of which technology to use is space or footprint limitations. What will fit in the space available? Unfortunately, the answer is not as simple as technology X will always fit in a tight space and give the best results. The customer's goals for energy recovery combined with any space limitations will result in different answers for different buildings. As I mentioned earlier, SAM has a high velocity option that uses wider spacing to allow more airflow, but this does sacrifice some latent recovery. Wheels also have a wider spacing media option that allows for more airflow, but results in reduced sensible and latent effectiveness. But these options can sometimes help these technologies fit. Metal plate exchanger, membrane, and SAM can all be configured in either a vertical or horizontal orientation and can be put together in different aspect ratios. A wheel cassette is square. So whether airflows are side by side or top and bottom, this won't change the dimensions. The key takeaway here is to recognize there is a difference between designing an exhaust air engine recovery system for new construction or major remodel versus retrofitting an existing system. For a retrofit, you start with the height and width constraints and the needed airflow, then see what type of performance is possible from each technology and make a decision based on what is most important for the specific project. Is it performance, price, or difficulty to install in the current system? If you start with, thou must have a 70% total effectiveness, the conclusion might be that exhaust air and recovery is not possible. But using this approach, you may conclude that there is a choice that fits, just maybe with less performance like an energy wheel that can achieve only 55% total effectiveness during both winter and summer design conditions, or a SAM that can achieve 70% total in the winter, but only 40% total effectiveness in the summer. After discussing the previous factors that impact the decision of what technology to use, the choice will now come down to the customer goals. If they have goals for energy recovery, are they just wanting to meet code minimum or are they going for the highest recovery possible? Is maximizing the cooling load reduction the most important? 
Or is maximizing the heating load reduction the most important? Or if the system fan power is already high, do they need to keep pressure drops low? Maybe this even supersedes the importance of effectiveness. Depending on the answers, this will drive the technology selection. For comfort cooling and heating in commercial buildings, the most common choice is a total energy recovery wheel. More often than not, they are the most cost-effective way of meeting the energy code requirements. But the customer's specific goals may change that answer. For some building owners, the most important factor might be low maintenance. This may drive some to request membranes rather than wheels. Some building owners want fewer moving parts and are willing to pay the higher price for a lower maintenance solution. Thank you, Ronnie. We hope you enjoyed and found today's program a helpful way to understand air-to-air -air energy recovery. As always, the bibliography included in your handout provides more information on where to find several resources related to today's topic, or contact your local train account manager for specific information on train systems, equipment, controls, and services. For those of you seeking continuing education credit, check out the newest online courses in the Train Education Center and fill out a survey to let us know what you think of today's program. Finally, ask your local host for details about upcoming ENL programs. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time.